Welcome to AEC Stories. This is former SM3 Dempsey of the USS Mount Hood. And today I am with another fellow shipmate that was on my ship um, at the end, the final days. Um, I was kind of there the midlife of the ship in the 80s and uh, the early 90s. And uh, I just got back from visiting a fellow signalman who'd had the same job as me, um, John Aiken, in Kansas. It was nice to go back in time and see who was on the signal bridge years before me, over a decade before me during the Vietnam era. But uh, Joshua has come through me through uh, another shipmate, and, and today we want to talk about you know his experience going into the Navy. So anyways, Joshua, welcome aboard. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. So we've had a few conversations. You were on the same ship, the USS Mount Hood. Uh, it had been moved from the Concord Naval Weapons Station up to Bremerton, Washington, correct? Right. As a matter of fact, when I was first getting out there um, to uh, get on the ship, um, they had just left Alameda and was actually headed down to San Diego for a little bit, and then they were going to be reassigned to Bremerton, Washington from that point forward. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, I remember talking to a guy that was, um, a civilian guy that was in charge of the EOD, all the bombs that would go in all those different bunkers on the base in Concord. Yeah. And, uh, poor guy passed away a week after, um, he retired because it was his sense of purpose. It was his reason to be. He loved that job. Oh. And when they shut down the base, man, it was like, oh, um, I don't have nothing else to do. Nothing like it in the world. Right. You know, but, uh, yeah, that, that base is now being converted into golf courses and other things. Oh, you're kidding. And, uh, huh. oh yeah. Your memories are changing behind you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really? For real? Wow. So, so tell me, how did you come to join the Navy? And, and you're from Virginia, right? Correct. Yeah. I'm actually from a, a little town down in the southwestern side of Virginia, not West Virginia, but southwestern side of Virginia, close mm -hmm. to, uh, Tennessee, Kentucky. West Virginia, around in that area. But, uh, I joined back in, in 1997 and I was, uh, straight out of high school at that point. Mm hmm. I, uh, I remember we were talking about this and, uh, you know, you were looking for the, the real Navy experience and things were changing the policies and, you know, right. you were looking for like, I want to be like grandpa. He was a little more like John Wayne or Clint Eastwood or something, right? <laughs> right. Well, what it was, was, um, early on in, in high school, I kind of thought about the military and thought, you know, I saw some Marines over on the side, you know, in our lunchroom, uh, kind of standing there at attention, waiting for people to come up and address them. And so, of course, I did. And I was, you know, extra small for my size or for my age and everything. But, uh, I went over and talked with them and, you know, just seeing kind of seeing what the, the Marines were all about and everything. And um, later on in high school, I had an opportunity to uh, join with uh, Junior ROTC. It was uh, in Richlands High School where I graduated from. And they um, it was their first year running the program. So I got to be a part of that and did two years in high school with that and then segued into going into the Navy. Um, I was actually going to be, uh, going into the air force, but we unfortunately, uh, lost our recruiter at the time. So I went and talked to the other branches and I was, I was set up on the Navy real quick. I just knew those, I knew, I knew I was meant to be a sailor. <laughs> it's interesting how that comes to be. I tried to join the air force too. Then later find out that it's really hard making rank in that organization. If you didn't pick the right, you know, MOS or the right job. Right. Or, you know, or opportunities for advancement could be limited. There's a lot of things that you don't know going in. You're like, oh, I could go here and then I could become a, a sergeant or a whatever, an E6 right. and E7. And, you know, you, the Navy has some of the fastest advancement program that I've seen. Right. Um, in the Army, you can go pretty quickly. It, it all depends what your specialty is. And it also depends on what rate you pick. Like, I took the uh, E5 exam twice, past not advanced, because they were only allowing like two or three signalmen in the fleet to become an E5 that year. Oh, so yeah, yeah. you kind of like, okay, well, I'm qualified for a pay raise, but no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I don't know what those other signalmen did. Maybe they, you know, you know, saved an admiral from a, a speeding bus and pushed him out of the way and they get some kind of medal for it. But, 
You know, <laughs> you kind of wonder. A, I got a NAM and they advanced me. <laughs> Pretty much. It's about how it went in some cases, I'm sure. Because it has to get down to the real nitty gritty. I mean, you got two guys that are, are squared away and they, they get everything done and they, they score high enough and everything. It's got to come down to, to fraction points of, you know, who does what millimeters. Yeah. Yeah. His semaphore was one word a minute faster. So we gave him the rank. That, yeah. Know. Really? For real. Oh, man. you didn't drink your coffee that morning. And Billy, he had two pots to the head. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was transmitting at 24 was, words a minute. He, he was on it that day. Yeah. Really? For real. <laughs> so where did you go to boot camp? Where did you end up going? Um, I actually went up in, uh, uh, Great Lakes. I was up there. I joined August, got out of boot camp in the middle of October. So I was missed, it pretty hot and pretty hot and humid up there when you were up there. It was, it was a little hot and humid and a little cold. I got lucky in the fact that I went in when I did. Um, there was kind of talk of me. I was hesitant at first of, of joining and I thought, well, if I, if I stay out three more months and everybody was like, I don't think you want to do that. And then when I got up there and I graduated boot camp, I actually stayed for hospital corpsman school and realized why the, the, I was, I was driving around in the duty truck over in the, the boot camp side and all these people had their, their, their foul weather jackets on and their, their anti-freeze gear, whatever it was. And I was like, man, yeah. I'm so glad I didn't join three months later because I would have been out in this. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty bad too. They were running around in snow. I was like, man, I got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> So were you, you were slated for, uh, possibly becoming a corpsman with other ratings or what was your, uh, possibilities of what you would be when you grew up there at the time? Well, when we went in, they were, uh, I told them I wanted the, the highest ranking I could get, you know, whatever my ASVAB could get the best school. So they weeded through a bunch of them and they ended up with, uh, looking at core school was definitely one that needed people badly. And I qualified and I was like, well, you know, I had taken two years of Latin in high school and I had thought about at one point, maybe doing something in the healthcare profession. So I thought this was a good segue in. So I ended up taking that route. It, it, when they were mentioned in the other ones, I really didn't even give them a second thought because I was like, well, I really want to help people and I'm doing this selflessly anyway. So my goal here is to segue that into the civilian community once I retire, because at that point I had planned on retiring out of them. Yeah. You were looking at a career. So you I were was. looking at like, okay, I can, I have a rating that will mean something. See, my rating did not have any application directly to the civilian world. <laughs> it yeah. was a Navy. It was a sailor based job. You well, know, maybe some of it would have translated over to the fleet, maybe the merchant fleet, but go on. Ironically, when I went to, when I went through a school, my first initial reaction was thinking, I'm going to be able to be a doctor when I get out. And I had an old chief, um, who was explaining it to me and he was telling me, he's like, I could retire right now. He said, and I'd qualify to uh, be a candy striper. And that'd be about it. <laughs> I was like, I, I was like, wait a minute, dude. That's, that's something you do when you're in high school. He said, exactly. You know, he, he said, he said, you gotta, you gotta, further your education if you're going to plan on doing this. He said, your short duty time is going to be spent going to schools and stuff if you're planning on being a doctor when you get out. And I was, well, you know, it, it kind of, I don't know, best word for it was it turned me off of that rate pretty quick. So pretty you went quick. into core school and you decided to get out of it halfway through um, or quarter of the Actually, I, I went all the way up to the last two tests and they had given me uh, giving me orders to Camp Lejeune. I was supposed to be second Marine division and I was quite bitter about that. And I was like, well, you know, if I wanted to be a Marine, I'd have joined the Marines. And that was my thought on it. I was like, you're, you're going to give me a nine millimeter and then put a target on my shoulder. And, no, they're not supposed to shoot me. <laughs> I didn't believe that for a second. I was like, no, I'm good. Uh, why don't you go ahead and send me to the fleet undesignated? And, uh, they kind of talked with me a bit about it, you know, tried to tell me it wouldn't, it wouldn't be in my best interest. And I told them I, I was pretty much set on it. So, uh, when they didn't just give it to me, I ended up, uh, fell on the tests, the last tests on purpose. Kind of so a, kind of a out. black, well, yeah, kind of a black spot. And I wished I would have just went through with it. You know, I wish I wouldn't have done that, but 
at the time I was young and I wanted to get out to the fleet. I wanted to make a difference and I didn't want to be a Marine. So that's the route I ended up taking. So they sent me out to the fleet undesignated. <clears throat> actually lost me in a temporary holding unit for about three or four months. So I was in Chicago for almost a, a good eight month stretch of time, somewhere around there. And right, then just sitting around there. Yeah. Well, they lost me. They didn't, they didn't, uh, this guy came up to me um, at the temporary holding unit one day and I was standing watch and he said, when are you transferring out? Where are you supposed to go? I said, uh, I'm supposed to go to Dex Seaman school. He said, uh, yeah, well, when I said, I, I don't know. You guys got my orders. He said, well, I need to look into it. Cause you've been here a while. I said, I know everybody else is just cycling on through. So when he looked into it, he found out that I was supposed to leave, um, like three weeks after I got there, I was already supposed to have been done with Dex Seaman school and already pushed out to the fleet at that point. So yeah, oh, wow. and I was, I was not happy about the situation with that one. Cause I was like, you're just, you're just going to leave me in a temporary holding unit. This is boring. I'm standing watch all day, every day and <laughs> not doing anything else. Sure. Duty. Sure yeah. duty. Dressed up in a sailor uniform. Yeah, had there I you known, go. you know, I probably would have just tried to milk it a little longer. <laughs> like, no, I'm good right <laughs> well, here. You know, I said I was going next month. I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to uh, Chief uh, Johansson. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for real. Uh, I don't know who he is, but I made up that name. He's down in that one building. He's got He's my orders. He's down in that one building at the edge there. That, I don't know which <laughs> one, but that, you just go down that way, you'll find it. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't. I found it kind of boring up there when I get out on Liberty. I was like, get me out of here. I went to Great Lakes and uh, then I went to a school in Florida, which I love. Oh, OK, it was in Orlando. It was spring break time. We went to the Daytona 500 nice. and, you know, just had a great time. And that was like, wow, this is great duty. Yeah. You know, top top gun was out. Everything kind of looked like a top gun lifestyle, even though I wasn't flying a jet. And, uh, you know, it was it was cool. But. You uh you later get sent to the Mount Hood, huh? So you get where where did you meet up with? Them? Um, that was actually a story within itself. I, I when I got out of uh, Dex Seaman School, I got a I got a set of orders, and then a couple of days later, I got another set of orders, and then I went home to uh, my mom and dad were living in North Carolina at the time, so I went home on my first leave, and I was supposed to transition out from there. And I got another set of orders, and all three of them were different. One said to Bremerton, one said to Alameda, and one said San Diego. So I ended up picking the Alameda one because at that point they were still technically considered out of out, out of Alameda. So they hadn't transitioned to the Bremerton station yet, and I just went with that because when I looked it up, it was it was showing that that's where I was supposed to go because that's where the ship was originally stationed. So I took a four day bus ride, took a four or five day bus ride out from, from North Carolina on a Greyhound. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah that was fun. That's like, that, that's like the Walmart of transportation. Yeah, really. <laughs> it, it was, it was definitely a fun adventure on that one. I, I, it, staying four or five days on a bus is not pleasant at best. But then when I got to Oakland, I hadn't showered. I hadn't I hadn't shaved in four or five days, and uh, basically I was supposed to go, you know, report to the ship in my dress whites. So I was supposed to, you know, be presentable and 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 all that, and and you know, go ahead and check into my sh uh, my first ship. When they dropped me off the bus in Oakland, I was in that big terminal, that big bus station out there. And uh, I ran straight to the bathroom, and I'm trying to shave in the bathroom, and this dude's screaming at me, you can't shave in here. I'm, I got to. I'm like, you don't understand. I've, I have my dress whites on, and I'm like, look, look at me. I have to be clean shaven. He's like, you, if I let you do this, I'm gonna, I am have to let every homeless guy in Oakland do this. I'm like, yeah, but I don't have yeah. an option. I'm like, I'm shaving. I don't even care. <laughs> You're going to have to arrest me. <laughs> I'm not going to my ship without a clean face. Not happening. <laughs> I ended up finally he just let me do it. I said, I'll clean up my mess. He said, fine. I cleaned it up, got everything good to go and hopped a cab and told him I need to go to the Alameda, the Alameda, uh, uh, naval station. And he's, he says, okay, I hop in, throw my sea bag in and we travel what seems to be an eternity. 
and we get to the gate of the Alameda base and there's a dude standing guard there. And I'm trying to tell him that I'm on the Mount Hood and I'm here to meet up with my ship. And he's just looking at me, confused, just just bewildered. He said, the, the base is closed down. I was like, what do you mean the base is closed down? I was wow. like, no, no, no. He said, we're in the transition period no. right now. I said, no, I'm supposed to meet my ship here. He said, what ship are you on? I said, I'm on the USS Mount Hood. He said, man, that thing left like three days ago. I was like, oh, great, great. <laughs> Now, I'm out there. I have no money at this point. I have no money. I have no way of paying the cab guy the $100 fare that I'm supposed to pay him. I'm sitting there, and, and I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do. So this guy gets on the phone. He was really cool about it. He gets on the phone, and he starts making calls. I'm trying to figure out what to do with the cabbie. I ended up calling my dad. My dad had to Western Union me some out, out some money the next morning to pay the cabbie who kept my sea bag until I paid him. <clears throat> And I stayed wow. the night in the Alameda jail in a room that they had on one of the wings, uh, at the jail there. And, and, uh, uh, yeah, that was, that was, that was not a, not a fun experience at all. I was scared the entire time. I didn't know what was going on. Now the jail, as far as I know, there wasn't really anybody there. I think they had maybe a couple of detainees, but they were off on a different jail, uh, 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 cell block or whatever. But, uh, yeah, they ended up putting me up in this room and I asked the guy, I'm like, well, well, if this is a jail, can I smoke? He's like, yeah, but if you see anybody, put it down. <laughs> He's like, they will bum rush you. I was like, oh, great. <laughs> He's like, if anybody tells you to get on the deck, you just, you just get on the deck. Okay. Cause you, they don't know who you are. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, this, <laughs> welcome to the Navy. Welcome to the fleet. You know, that was my first taste of the fleet. Right. So luckily they had figured everything out and they cut me a ticket down to San Diego because that's where the ship was at the time. And uh, I ended up flying a little hopper flight down to San Diego and meeting up with the ship there. Ironically, when I got on board the ship, um, they had me scheduled as a hospital <laughs> corpsman. They had me billed as a hospital corpsman. And I was a deck seaman at that time. So I, something got really messed up with my paperwork along the way and it just caused chaos to ensue. <laughs> So did you work as a temporary corpsman? No, actually, they put me straight to deck. That's what I asked for. So that's what they gave me. <laughs> Bust and rust and chip and paint. Aye, aye, aye. You know, I was actually glad for it, though. I needed to, I needed to, uh, I needed to grow up a bit and I knew it. And, and I knew that doing it as a deck seaman was definitely going to give me that experience that I needed to be able to say, yeah, I've matured a lot and things like that. Cause that's ultimately one of the reasons I went in in the first place. I had uh, gotten a little uh little uh uh scholarship from Appalachia State University. It wasn't much. It was just, you know, kind of hey, won't you come hang out at our school for a little bit, you know, pay us some money. Get you an education kind of deal, but uh I had turned right. that down to go into the Navy cuz I knew that uh I knew that I wasn't going to be I was done with school at that point and I knew that I wasn't going to be nothing but a drain, you know, financially to my mom and dad. I, I kind of figured I would end up going to college, partying, getting you kicked out, and then what? You know, so this was my way of, of, of showing that I was mature enough to realize that I wasn't ready to handle that kind of thing and, and do a different route. So I was looking forward to, uh, you know, doing a little bit of growing up, you know, uh, becoming a man. A deck, deck's, a, deck's a good place. Deck's a good place to yeah, get manly. Yeah, it is. It, yeah. It's definitely uh, a lot of manly work and a lot of... You know, huffing and puffing and, you know, but you were, you were getting in at a different period and right. I'm not demoting that or anything, but like you told me in boot camp, they had stress cards. We didn't have anything like that. They'd call you every name in the book right to your face. Yeah. You know what I mean, the, um, and the, it was like the, the more hardcore, it was not Marine Corps boot camp. It was the Navy, but you know, the difference between rated uh, G or PG versus rated right. R. You know yeah, what I mean? well, they definitely toned things down by the time I went in. You know, I was expecting, you know, when I was in high school, my grandpa, who was, you know, he was prior military, he was prior uh, Army and Air Corps, and uh, he would, he, I would go over to visit, and he'd say, where's your uniform? You need to have, to have, you need to have that uniform on at all times. He's like, I was like, well, they don't want us to wear it all the time. He's like, no, if you have a uniform, you wear it. Yeah, he's one of those guys. 
He, yeah. he taught me how to shine my shoes. He taught me about a gig line. I was squared away before boot camp as far as that stuff was concerned. Cause he, he definitely, he's real proud of me, but you know, it was, uh, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it right. So that's what I was expecting when I came in. I was like, okay, they're going to toughen me up. They're going to make a man out of me, you know, and we got to boot camp and they explained that we wouldn't be, uh, drilling with the, uh, wooden rifles anymore. And that uh, basically we were going to get this little yellow card called a stress card. And if you're stressed, you're supposed to pull this thing out and tell them that they're stressed and uh, you, that you're stressed. And they're supposed to stop all activity for you so you can calm down. Kind of like, you know, the beginning stages of a uh, uh, safe space. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I only know of one guy in my division that actually pulled it out. And when he did... They made everybody suffer for it. He stood there and held his little stress card and everybody else did push ups and, you know, did a rain dance <laughs> in the compartment. So he learned real quick that, you know, everybody else is looking at you while they're doing their push ups. Like, yeah, you just stand there and hold that card. <laughs> I think, I, I, I think that stress card actually is just, uh, yeah, it, it, that's an interesting way to hear that the stress card worked the opposite way. Where it's, it's like whether you're in Navy SEAL training and you're not getting your runs in time. So you're the last team in with the boat. You guys are to do pushups for three more hours. Well, the other guys hit, hit chow. <laughs> the same thing with this is kind of like, um, you know, you, uh, yeah, you get a stress card. Johnny's going to take a time out. But on the other side, they turned up the screws on you right. guys. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, it makes sense though. You I had know, no idea. The day they had the, the soap and sock beat. You know, to get somebody in line, the soap and sock was a way to go. You know, in 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 the yep. newer Navy, I guess is the best way to put it. In the kinder, gentler Navy, is how as they like to put it. Um, it was okay. You you get your time out, but everybody else here is still going to work. And they're they're well, while they're putting in that work, they're knowing. You know, the the entire time they're looking at you, not working. So it, it's, it's kind of a, yeah. it's kind of a, we're going to hold you accountable. You know, you're going to hold yourself accountable. You, you see, too. I misunderstood it as though everyone's pulling these cards and everyone's, I'm too stressed. Maybe they're pulling them more now and it's really being used now. And it may be a kinder, gentler process. I don't know. I mean, you're the closest, you're at the inception yeah. of it. And, uh, we don't know till I interview somebody who's a little further down the right. line, right? I, I, but the military, the military is there to toughen you up and make you be ready to react in an emergency exactly. situation, whether it be a fire or, you know, something goes wrong with the big heavy machinery or the ship takes a, you know, has a whole water's coming on, a lot right. of things. So that's the attention to detail training. But the timeout card was probably initially a pacification for some kind of stuff going on in, at the upper echelon, like we're having too many people get uh, these lawsuits or early PTSD in boot camp because they've never been away from home and now they're freaking out because they're homesick or well, whatever. There was a lot of push. And that may be what it is. There was a lot is. of push on hazing at, 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 during that time, too. Not just yeah. military hazing. There was a lot of push on hazing in high schools with sports teams. So that there was a lot of national attention, I believe, on the whole hazing aspect and, and what it's actually causing. Like, I remember right before I went in, they were talking about... Um, seals pinning each other, you know, and things like that and how horrid it was. And, you know, I always thought of it as kind of like a rite of passage, you know, and I understand that there was extreme cases, but, you know, when I got to the Mount yeah. Hood, they did a, a, it wasn't really hazing. It was, you get your quote unquote beat down, which is, we're going to bring you in. We're going to put you in your place real quick. You don't know everything. You don't know anything. And we're going to start you from scratch kind of deal. Like, welcome to the ship, but don't get cocky. <laughs> you don't know as much as you think you yeah. do. It's completely different. Right. Like, I actually told a bunch of guys, and I'm sure I'm probably going to get in trouble for this one, but when I was on the Camden, I was getting ready to trans uh, transition over into my actual rate that I struck into, which was in aviation. And they really didn't have very much for me to do because they didn't have an aviation crew on that ship. But... um I was teaching a class to to the new boot camps that were on the ship, and I was telling them, you know, get you a piece of paper. And they they all break out their pieces of, you know, they all break out their notebooks and 
get their pencils ready. I was like, all right, so write down every single thing that you learned in boot camp. I said, I write, I mean, I started naming things off. You write down this, 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 you know, write down everything that you learned in boot camp. And there was, you could see there were some people like feverishly writing and there was a couple other people that could kind of, I guess they were watching me and could see I was being a little bit condescending in it. And I told him, I said, all right, now take out that piece of paper, rip that piece of paper out and go take you a healthy shit and wipe your ass with it. That's what it means out here. I was like, it doesn't, it, it doesn't mean anything. I was like, you know, they, it was to get you in that mind frame so that when you got out to the fleet, you were more prepared for what you were going to have to deal with. You know, that was, yeah, it was, it was getting you ready to deal with, um, a little more stressful life environment to take orders right. and to pay attention to things, which if you just let people walk in at their own pace, let's say you join the Navy and you walk right to a ship, you skip boot camp. <laughs> there could be a serious learning curve and a lot more things could go wrong. Like, well, Hey man, what were you yelling at? Yeah, you, really? <laughs> you my boss? And some, you know, it's like and some can, things, especially like underway right? replenishments are so fast paced and so dangerous that you ain't got time to be awestruck, you know, with your jaw dropped, like, Oh wow. You don't have time for that. You got to go and you got to make things happen because if you don't, something could happen. Something could go wrong. Somebody step in a bite of a line because they're not paying attention and they're gone. That's it. You know, it's, it's, it was, it's serious yeah. work because there is a lot of danger involved. I don't think people realize that, you know, that any mundane little thing that we take for granted as, uh, you know, doing in the Navy on a daily basis is still potentially dangerous. You know, if you. Oh, well, yeah. That's, 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 that's the thing is to amp up your alertness mm -hmm. and your readiness and your mindset. Because, uh, you know, the lazy birds will fly through your head and the daydreaming and it's like, no, wake right. up, son. You know, it's time to, it's time to mm -hmm. do this. And this is serious stuff, but everyone's making it look effortless. But the one moment you drop your guard, ah, a cable snaps and rips exactly. you in half. You have you to know? be alert. You have to. <clears throat> or that crane, that crane comes down and conks you on the head right. and you're done. It, you know what I mean? It's just so exactly. many things. So, you know, I, I think, I think that right. was ultimately what it was for me as far as, you know, getting out of, out of boot camp and transitioning through and then, and then kind of helping some other shipmates out that uh, came in after me to explain to them that, you know, it's not as, it's not as rigid as you believe it is. You know, that's a little bit more laid back, but it's still, it's serious work and you got to, uh, you got to take it seriously. So like when I got on the Mount Hood and they, they were, everybody was doing their little quote unquote, new hazing, you know, welcoming the new arrivals. There was guys fighting. There was guys running and you ain't going to get me. And, and man, they got it bad. And I finally, I just walked over to the table. I was like, lay down. Go ahead. Give it to me. They're like, oh, see this. Dude. I'll give you the pink. Give you the old <laughs> yeah. the pink belly. They're like, there this you dude go. right here, man, he knows yeah. what's up. I was like, well, you know, if you, if you're going to do it, I, I might as well not fight it. Yeah. I know it's, it's in good humor. You're not, you're not torturing them. You know, I didn't end up in medical. Heck, the guys that were fighting back didn't end up in medical. They, they weren't injured. It was a, just a, a kind of a rite of passage and also, uh, remember your place. You know, everybody starts at square one. <laughs> I think also that your time in the Navy, 99 on up, you guys had gotten rid of the showback initiation yeah, as well. Yeah. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Look at, look, look at, look at all those things. Like some things get softened up, but by talking to you, you gave a different meaning to the stress card because I'm thinking everyone's like, I quit. Mm -hmm. But yeah, then you might, you still might get a blanket party or checked in line because you uh, made everybody else do extra pushups and someone's pissed right. off at you. Um, so that, that, that explains that a little differently, but the hazing subsided. I don't know if the cussing and the language you had a, a more female integrated Navy. So a lot of sexual harassment training and stuff too, especially on the AEs right. because there was more female shipmates. Right? Yeah. There, there was, there um, was more of that kind of stuff. It was more of a, um, like, like, I was, like I was saying, as far as the hazing and stuff was going, I think there was a lot of that in the community outside of the military. So there was a lot of eyes on the military because, you know, pretty obvious. That if you're going to have hazing, it's probably going to be done there. Um, but, but yeah, right. as far as like, you know, the difference in training and stuff like that, I think they were just trying to come into a new light as far as the Navy was concerned, make it a little less, little less yeah. like grandpa's Navy and a little bit more like <clears throat> a modern day Navy. 
and they ended up taking out the shell backing yeah. um, that you couldn't cuss. I, I remember um, trying to write a guy up once when I was a petty officer and I, I said a couple choice words and literally while we're talking, you know, he, uh, my, my LPO who sat in on the, on the, uh, the write up said, you can't, you can't talk to him like that. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, you can't speak to him like that. This is wow. the kindler, gentler Navy. I said, dude, if you can't handle somebody cussing you out, what are you doing in the Navy? You know, I mean, ain't they yet? Yeah. And that was, that was, that was my Navy yeah. and your grandpa's Navy. Ain't that they was ever normal. heard the term cuss like a sailor. Normal. There's a reason they say that, you know? <laughs> Well, we still had some of that going on within without being sexually offensive and stuff when, you know, the first three years it was all men. It was anything goes. And then it became, we had females integrate into the Mount Hood. We had a group of like 55 and they were coming on to an alpha male loaded ship pretty much. And, but everybody got mad, serious sexual harassment training. So people stayed in line. They were professional. We didn't have a lot of issues or problems that I know of, you know, and, um, you know, some people did meet up and get married and they're still happily married. And, you know, some people had a little something, something I'm guessing, you know, I'm not the, the ship's uh, drama, you know, romance writer here, but people did their jobs very professionally. And we even had, um, uh, the Chang from our ship, chief engineer, female officer. She's now like a four star admiral. Admiral Oh, right on. Yeah. I've seen that on the, the, uh, on the uh, page on Facebook. Yeah, Yeah. That was, that's really cool. Yeah. So for me, it was a weird situation to go from what I expected it to be. And I grew up around all these airborne guys and on the army base as a kid. And I'm like over here with, okay, we're raw, hardcore Navy, you know, drinking, cussing, fighting and everything yeah. else, <laughs> and, you know, and, and then we get on to this thing like, okay, watch your P's and Q's and uh, don't be doing that. And, you know, don't sexually harass your female shipmates. Definitely don't do that. And you'll be out of here so quick. You'll be a petty officer today and in a brig tomorrow. So watch yourself. Right. And so that puts you on guard a little bit. But when you came in, it was more, you know, adjusted it by that. definitely you had. Know? I mean, that we yeah. had, they were definitely against fraternization, obviously. But, you know, if you were. For sure. If you were lower echelon and everything like E1, E2, and you weren't in the same division as the person that you were hooking up with, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, they really didn't, they would watch you and they would warn you. But as far as anything else goes, as, as long as you didn't get stupid with it, you know, like, you know, have your little breakup fight down on the main deck while, while quarters is going on. Um, they were pretty cool. You know, they, they kind of like, they, they understood. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Plus there was, you oh, know, yeah. we had the, we did have the aspect of the West coast widows too. So, you know, I think a lot, a lot of people took that into consideration as well. You know, it's, it's once the ship's gone, hmm, people going to do what they're going to do. Well, that would happen. A lot of, I've never really talked about that on podcasts, but I don't mind. I mean, I know that one ship pulls out, another one pulls in. It's, you know, these guys leave their wives or girlfriends behind for six months. And six months is a hell of a trial period because you're young. You have hormones. You're bored. Well, you know, one indiscretion never hurt anybody before you know it. It becomes like, okay, let me time this right. Yeah, You know, Bill or Sally is coming home from sea. (laughs) <laughs> and so a lot of infidelity dude, on every aspect and everywhere, but you know, that just depends. Well, you know, like when you we know, went on it, our mini pack there, when we came back, there was a guy that came back to the ship and, you know, we, I knew who he was and everything and, and kind of knew a little bit of his backstory and all that. But he came home from his mini pack to a completely cleared out house and a note just chilling as soon as he opened the door. <laughs> You know, she had, well, she had power of attorney while he was gone. And he kept noticing while we were underway oh, that money was coming missing. He wasn't getting his paychecks. Shoot. He couldn't figure it out. All of a sudden there's a loan being taken out. He couldn't figure out what was going on, but it, 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 I guess she just, she ran him, she ran him high and dry and then just ditched him, you know, just, yeah. Ruined, it. Ruined his credit and everything. Right. Put him in debt. Yeah. He got one hell of a, one hell of a John Deere right. letter. You know, okay, it's a dear, it's a dear John, but I like John Deere letter. It's always funny. <laughs> oh, look at the tractor company has sent me a letter. How no, nice. that's, that's your spouse. 
that's your spouse leaving yeah. you. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, I mean, it, there was instances like that. That, that, that didn't happen to it, the culture. It evolved. I mean, we're talking, everything was changing. People could look at their stuff back home online. Mm-hmm. We didn't see it. You'd find that stuff out. I had two petty officers come back. Both of their, uh, wives had gone off with other men. One of them got one back. The other one that broke up and he didn't get to see his kid. And he just went on a rager and eventually get himself kicked out of the military. Yeah. So it was very hard hitting emotionally and very like, I, I just went to war. And now you're treating me like oh, this and like, I'm all, all, all of this is for what? And then I can see a guy or a gal in despair over that situation. Right. right? Um, and, and that's, that's what it was out of sight, out of mind. I mean, we weren't emailing and Skyping, well, you know, we might get a cassette player of them talking to I- us. Back when I was in, before you were in, they had internet. I we think, had then. just well, the internet right? was really just kicking up. Like we didn't have cell phones; wouldn't work. You know, especially if you were out to sea. You, you know, you get two miles outside of land, and and that's it. Um, we did have the internet, th- a, a similar version of the internet. It was more like uh, just email um, at that point. Like we, okay. their Facebook wasn't around or anything like that. But you could still correspond. They'd have times where you could, uh, uh, you know, do your phone calls and they would have the ship's line, um, that would be open for a duration oh, of time. Really? Yeah. Which was horrible. Oh my God. <laughs> that was, it was almost not worth it because you get this $15 phone call or $15 phone card to call home and it'd eat up the minutes like it was nothing. And then the whole time it was like an overlap. You'd have to wait five, six seconds to get their words. And, and, and it just became, you know, a 10 minute conversation of interrupting, interrupting each other the entire time. <laughs> so that's, that's insanity. Could you, could you hang on for just one sec? I'm going to put us on right. pause. Well, I'm back. I'm back, sir. You there? Yeah. Yeah. I'm here. Yeah. I'm here. Hello. There you go. Okay. <clears throat> Anyways, um, yeah, coming back to a whole new household was a very uh, entertaining thing for a lot of guys. And uh, people found out later, you know, uh, who, why is all my stuff gone? Right, yeah. <laughs> I've had a guy who, who retired, who retired, and uh, 20 years later, he was like, who's this person I was having a one-night stand with that turned into a marriage 20 years ago that uh, I haven't seen for Sixteen years at sea. Yeah, you know what I mean, <laughs> I, I think there's a little bit of a that lure, you know, from the military. Uh, also, as far as you know, uh, people getting married young and things like that. There's a little bit of that. Um, I don't, I don't know what the. the I guess yeah. the best thing, the best uh, wording for it would be something like a, a fantasy island type thing. You know, you you're expecting a scarcity. That. It's a it's a scarcity mindset. It's a scarcity mindset. I mean, it's one thing to get married because you get some pregnant. And you want to take care of the kids, but you know, when you're young and you're not hardly around, you can't really let that, the relationship doesn't develop the same way it does, you know, face to face every day. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. You get, you, and that's, that's a challenge. Well, you know, like, especially with the Mount Hood decommissioning, there was a lot of families and we did a lot of underway time in our last year. I mean, we were out a lot. You know, it's, I think out mm-hmm. of four years, I served two and a half of them almost at sea. So it was a lot of underway time. And, and, you know, the, it was, it was hard for a lot of guys because they had their families and their, you know, their kids were young and things like that. And they would have to go out for two weeks. Ironically, we would pull out and it would be sunny and we would pull in and it would be raining every time. You know, because this is this is we were up in Washington, so I believe it like rained somewhere up in Washington every day, pretty much. Uh, but we always pulled out on a sunny day, and that's always like the worst feeling when you know you're leaving home port and you're leaving everybody there, and it's it's sunny, and then you pull back in and it's just gloomy, rainy. <laughs> it's, it's like gloomy is a horrible. Right. It's like you don't even want to be out there mooring the ship up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. And then the tedious tasks. Well, they well, they did say that they they said it's a very suicidal state because it has the most rain, more dreary gray days than anywhere. Uh, yeah, I, right? there, I don't know what it is. It, it always had this kind of almost gothic, you know, feel to it, like you know, Gotham by Gaslight kind of 
kind of feel to it. There was always like an overcast. Um, it was, it was beautiful up there. Don't get me wrong. Absolutely beautiful. Everywhere you go in Washington is real, real pretty. Um, good, good landscape to look at, real lush green scenery all around you and things like that. But, you know, when you're wanting to go out and go fishing or go, you know, uh, 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 camping or something like that, you always had to extra prepare for if it rained, you know, and that was something I wasn't used to from back in Virginia. You had, you had times where you could look up and say, okay, it's probably not going to rain for a good four or five days. I'm good to go. You know, Washington, it was always a crapshoot. It was always, I don't know, but uh, I think that was what took a, took a toll on a lot of guys, uh, as far as being underway. I mean, there were times where we would be out for, I believe we pulled one at one point we were doing circles and stuff. And I think we pulled probably about a good almost month out at sea or something like that. And you know, that that's when it gets real tedious and real, like I remember pulling into Hawaii one time and being one Valentine was standing out back and we were pulling, you could see Maui off in the very, very far distance. And we had been, we had been underway so long. I, 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 I like was dragging my foot up to him, you know, looking like I was Easter or, or Igor. And I was like, uh, master, look, land, land. And he starts <laughs> crying. He's like, you ain't right, Hill. What's wrong with you, man? You know, it's like, it, but it was a, I always had a big joke about it. You know, I always tried to make light of it because it, it, it can get so monotonous. Like I would do mission impossible in between the, uh, the, the bombs and stuff like that and act like I was on a covert mission, <laughs> you know, just stupid stuff like that to get people laughing because you're underway. What are you going to do? You know, you can, you can be yeah. mad about it, but it ain't going to get any, anything for anybody. You're still going to be underway. At the end of the day, you're going to go to sleep in your rack. And when you wake up, you're going to wake up in that rack. So, you know, yeah. I always, I, I'm sure I was probably a little bit of a, 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 a cocky little ass at some points. And I'm sure that, you know, I did rub some people the wrong way, but for the most part, I, I tried to make things a little bit light for me and for people around me, because you might as well smile at the end of the day. If you don't, you're just going to be miserable. Yeah, it's true. Um, <clears throat> but it was a good experience for, I mean, how long did you serve after the Mount Hood? Um, I did my full four years. I actually, I went, um, I served on the Mount Hood. We decommissioned it. And then, um, because I was an undesignated, uh, undesignated seaman at that time, um, we didn't have a choice in orders and all of the AOEs were, uh, stationed up in Bremerton. So they rolled me right over to the, the USS Camden, the mighty pachyderm. Um, there was, there was actually a couple of us that ended up rolling over there. I believe, uh, Dixon uh, was there. Torres went there. Uh, Speckner went there. Uh, O'Shaughnessy went there. Um, there was actually quite a few of us. Some of us got lucky and were able to transfer directly into their A school. Like they were striking in and they got accepted for an A school so they could, roll right over from the Mount hood and, and, and go into their a school. And then of course, you know, some people were up for orders so they could do their bidding. But as far as if you were an undesignated seaman, you just kind of go, you went where they, where they, uh, where they wanted you to. We even had an instance with a guy, um, who didn't realize until after the, the ship had decommissioned that he had only signed up for two years. I don't know what happened with his paper, but, uh, yeah, when when I think they even I, I now don't don't quote me on this. You'd have to ask him, but uh, I believe he got an option whether he wanted to stay in or whether he wanted to get out at that point. Wow. So you know, I I don't remember exactly what happened with that situation. I think he ended up staying in for a while, but uh, yeah, there was an instance like that. It was we were the last AE in the fleet at that point. We were. Uh, scarcely manned. I know that I don't remember exactly what the percentage was, but I believe at one time they were tossed around like 50 or 60 percent manned. So I think we were kind of like, we were kind of like the little hood rats. We were, we were, the, we felt, we kind of <laughs> felt like the outcasts in a way, I guess, you know, kind of like we were the forgotten ship of the fleet, but we did a lot. And, you know, it was a, it was a really good command. I always look back on that and say, 
if I had to pick my favorite command, and you remember, I mean, uh, I went brown shoe at one point. I went uh, worked for a squadron, which is a completely different life. But I still looked back on my days on the Mount Hood, and so that was as close to the Navy as I'm going to get. You know, the 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 old school right. Navy because they still did things like pull you up in the forward hold and you know talk with you. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> when they needed to have a chat with you, there would yeah. be somebody standing outside of, of a, a dog down door. <laughs> so they did a little, a little yeah. EMI, a little extra military. Exactly. Yeah. Right? Yeah. One on one, you know, chat like that, but a little real personal <laughs> little emotional expression. Therefore, <laughs> yeah, I get it. That's uh, that was the end of that right. era. But where did you go? So you went, how, how long did you go on the Camden for before you ended up with uh, the aviation squad? I did, squadron? I believe about a year with the Camden. Um, uh, it ended up being segmented out to where I was almost a year in Chicago. Then I was a little over a year with the Mount Hood. And then I did about a year with the Camden. And then I went into uh, VAQ 137, which is ironically decommissioned too. I, it, all of my commands, as a matter of fact, the, the Mount Hood, the Camden, and VAQ-137, as far as the Prowlers go, the EA-6Bs, they're all decommissioned now. So I, I feel really old now. <laughs> all of the stuff that I worked on is oh, all of them. gone, you know? Uh, I still feel that way. I, I live in that environment. I mean, I live near Alameda and Concord and all those places where my ship was once, which was a live and thriving military environment. Which has now been, you know, changed over to whatever. Right. You know what I mean? It's not, you know, it's not what it was. Um, <clears throat> so I see it and I'm like, okay, we were in this cowboy movie with John Wayne and everything. Now all the buildings are falling over and you look behind and it was props holding up the right. sticks and so on and so yeah. forth. Right. And, and that's what you kind of take away from it. You kind of take that away. You're like, well, yeah, here uh, today, here, I guess, uh, here, whatever here today, gone tomorrow. Definitely with that, you know, especially with, you know, a lot of adjustments that the, the Navy did when they did some downsizing and stuff, they closed a lot of bases down that I know people didn't want to be closed down and, uh, shuffled a lot of ships to new ports and, and it kind of, it, it, it I don't know. I, it, it did something like, it feels like a ghost town in some cases, you know? Like Bremerton, Bremerton yeah. felt like naval base, naval community. But even the short time that we were able to spend, cause we did go down to San Francisco, um, you know, and a lot of guys that were on the Mount Hood that lived in the area that was going, going home for them cause they could, you know, hop the train and go down or, you know, hop in a car, or rent a car, have their spouse come pick them up. And they could go home for the weekends and stuff like that. So it was kind of like a little bit of a homecoming for them. And when they come back, you could see it, you know, that it was longing for, you know, the things of the past kind of deal. And you just kind of have to accept it when you're in the military that uh, when you move on, time goes on, you know, and I think it's a hard thing for people to accept because I still have a, I still have a, a, a fond memories of, 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 taking the ship down to, you know, San Diego and, and, and going off the coast there and just doing circles and stuff like that. And knowing that at the end of the day, you were going to be able to pull back in and, you know, go out and, you know, go to TJ if you wanted to, or, you know, things like that. So it, it, it but they've downsized a lot of that stuff now. So it, it, for, yeah, it's, it's, it's sure been a, been a change, yeah, right? <laughs> for us, it's more of the, I remember when, you know, for this new class of, of recruits coming out, it's going to be a, yeah, I hear stories of, you know? Yeah. But it's, I mean, the, the, the last space is Bremerton still active, I believe. And so is San Diego, but the Bay area is gone for the right. Navy. Except for fleet week, you can pull in and, uh, stride up and down with the uniforms and get some veteran love, which is yeah. good, but then yeah. it's gone. You know what I mean? And, and it's, uh, it's weird. To see your history deleted behind you. Yeah. You know, I mean, you go to Naval Air Station Alameda now and it's like the commissary is a defunct, funky building. A lot of the, some people have rented the housing, got a hook up there somehow. And, you know, I almost rented a room at a, you know, former admiral's house just to say that'd be cool and hop on the ferry to San Fran. But I later, my wife and that never, we decided to do something else, but I look at it and I go, okay. 
this is the deal. This is what it was, and this is what right. it is. But I do have a lot of shipmates that are from my era that live here still. And we do hang out, you know, every other month or so, or sometimes twice a month. And we're all, like, aware of each other, and we kind of keep it like it's yesterday, right. you know? Well, see, I still... But, but for you, you, you you're in... You were everywhere and and then nowhere and everywhere at the same time. Right. <laughs> kind of like a ghost. Yeah. I mean, I did. I pretty much did that. You know, it, it was I was here, here for a time, here for a time, here for a time. So I never really sat, sat long. You know, I know a lot of guys that, you know, spent their entire four years at one command and then rolled over to shore duty or whatever. For me, it was kind of just hopping to where they needed me and where I fit in, I guess, you know, the best way to best way to think about it, I guess. But, you know, I did a lot of a lot of bouncing around in the Navy, but I, I got to sample everything is what I tell people. You know, I got to I got to spend time with the temporary holding unit and know what that's all about. Got to spend time with being on a, a on a, a smaller size ship, got to spend time doing a decommissioning of a ship, got to, you know, roll over to another ship and, and, and understand how that whole transition works. Because like there was still guys that uh, I, I there's still guys from the Mount Hood that I talk to today and still keep up with. And I don't think I really have that with any other command. I mean, I, some of the guys that I still keep in contact with rolled over to the Camden with me. And some of the, uh, like, I, I think I may have two other people, Circa and Bigelow, who I, who I uh, uh, was in the uh, uh, aviation side with at my last command. And I, I, I don't keep up with anybody else. You know, it, they're all from the Mount Hood. You know, it, it's, uh, I, so you were you, you were a short you were a short timer in the aviation yeah, command, right? Yeah, you were there very, very right. briefly. But I got to you know I got to check it out. I was yeah. I was I didn't get very much time. You know I didn't get enough time to I guess be able to really do a lot of advancements and stuff. I mean I busted my butt. I got my claws knocked out. I was you know I tried to be as squared away as I could as far as that stuff was concerned, but. Uh, you know, it, it, there was only so much I could do because I was pretty much a short timer by the time I got there anyway. Yeah, well, that makes sense. But, you know, <clears throat> you get out and then the ad adapting to the civilian world becomes a strange new thing. You were born in the civilian mm -hmm. world, but now you adapt to it as an adult that has all this conditioning and, uh, you know, has this culture, the military right. culture. And uh, you're going in and you're meeting people that don't <laughs> don't know yeah, what the you hell start you're using about. acronyms and they go yeah. you you just see their eyes glaze over and <laughs> they have no clue and they don't want to interrupt you and say you're speaking a lot of jargon I don't know what you're talking about you know so yeah. like I still say you know uh, up against the bulwark or get over against the bulkhead or yeah. stand by that bulkhead or I'm going to the head yeah. or I'm gonna go get some chow. You know, I still catch myself every now and then saying some of that stuff. And the funny thing is, is you'll get, you know, the old salts. They'll be like, oh, yeah, chow, huh? You know, when you're still, you're still up there, shipmate. You know, like, you know, it's a, you haven't transitioned all the way. <laughs> uh, it, it happens. And it's been so like how many years since you've been out? I, I got out in 2001. Um, I got out in August 7th, 2001, uh, right before September 11th happened. Um, my enlistment was up and, you know, I, I ended up getting out, um, getting out of the Navy and, and, and going back into the civilian world. I, there was a lot that, you know, contributed to that. You know, the big thing was I had just had, uh, my first kid and I didn't want to do, you know, six months or a year underway kind of thing. I wanted to stay at home and raise my kid. And the Navy just was, they were downsizing at that point. So they were, they really wasn't able to offer me anything. Ironically, um, when I went through that whole procedure, I had a, a, an AM, uh, AM2, I think he ended up making AM1, um, who went to Bupers. Uh, he got orders to Bupers to help with that. So I was literally on the phone with a guy who I was working right alongside two months prior. And I'm on the phone with him saying, what can they do? And he really did fight for me. My command fought for me. They wanted to give me a reenlistment bonus. They wanted to get me orders that would suit me. And my family and everything. And, and it ended up being that they just weren't able to do anything for me. And I felt like it was my time to go ahead and roll over and, 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 uh, give up the ghost as far as my naval career is concerned and, and go on and transition back into the civilian community and do it, do it that way. I still, you know, I still look back now, like 
I would have been in 2017, I would have pulled my 20th year. So I still look at that and think, you know, man, yeah. I would have, I would have been able to retire at this point had I stayed in. It's not really a regret. It's just a, 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 a more of a, this is where I could have been had I stayed in kind of thing, you know, a, a comparison. Right. It's true. I only had 14 years to go, but I got injured, so that, that wasn't going to change. I was out yeah. anyways. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, my rating got, I think, uh, I forget when it was, they get rid of it, 2003. So, yeah, maybe I would have made, uh, yeah, I would have almost pulled off. I would have had to change rates for a few years, and then I would have been getting out. But I don't know. I'm glad that I went my civilian route because I had, I was too much of an entrepreneur and, I needed that to manifest. I felt like I was holding back, but I was loving the Navy at the same time. And then I love it in right. retrospect. And, you know, to, to many people, that's the greatest thing they've ever done because, uh, you know, you go from, let's say that you grow up on a farm, you're milking cows and you're doing field work and that's good, hard, honest work. And then, uh, one day, you know, you'd never been 14 miles out of your hometown or that one time you went to the watch the NASCAR race with the family yeah. and then back in yeah, Florida or whatever yeah. <laughs> and you're back and that's your life. And then, then all of a sudden you're 19 and you're on an airplane and you're in California and you're in San Francisco and you're in Washington and you're pulling into San Diego and you're in right. Hawaii and you know, you're in China and you're over in Japan. <clears throat> and this is all happening from 19 to 23, 24, 25 and you just see the yeah. world. And then you come back and that guy that you were milking cows with or whatever, he's, the head of the cow place now, but he's still your buddy. But you ask him where you been. He's like, well, you know, I went 15 miles outside the town, but not too much right. other than that. And <laughs> you and this guy, he's doing the same as he ever was, or he's got the same job. He has an advance. Right. And you've been trained in the world of advancement, make rank, improve, move forward. Some people are happy where they are. Not to say one's better than the other, but there's nothing like that rich life experience that takes you out of your, you know, your comfort zone right. and and you meet other people who are on this mystery cruise with exactly. you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, the people on the cruise ship with you are, are not your choice, <clears throat> but many of them uh, share a similar mindset. You know, Bob wanted to get out of Kansas. John wanted to get out of Texas. You know, Sam wanted to sneak out of Montana. Right. Mike was tired of the busy city of right. New York. Um, you know, you know, that, that this is, this is it. People want to see something, substantial and they, and you gain that experience. You can't take any other career like that. I mean, you could be a merchant seaman and travel the world, but you know, it, it's good to get the experience in the Navy and transition exactly. over, you know, at least you'll have perspective, right? But you know, kids, family, the, you know, even living stateside, it's hard to do, you know, living in California is it's so damn expensive that you're going to be underway at work. Right. <laughs> you know, you, you and your lady are going to be underway at work because you both got to work. There's no sitting around raising the kids like in Little House right. on the Prairie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is, that is come and gone, man. Those exactly. days are gone. And, uh, it, it's just a different world, but I'm sure the old, old salts and the new generation relates well to this. For me, as a former Mount Hooder, I hung out. I just got back from Kansas hanging out with, um, SM3 John Aiken, who was on, during the Vietnam era on the Mount Hood, the end of it. And he came out of Kansas and he showed me around Kansas for five days. It right. was great. And it was cool to meet the guy that stood on the same signal bridge as me and used the same flashing light and same flag bags and same semaphore sticks and same big eyes and sat there. And here was a little guy from Kansas. Not that little, but <laughs> he grew up to be in good shape and all that. But he was, he would sit there in the same signal bridge and see the world from the same perspective right. I did. Me and five other guys, which were later replaced by another five other yeah. guys, which, you know, and later replaced by five other guys, two gals, whatever the, you know, break out of that is, but five different yeah. people. And the Mount Hood was born in 1971 and it went, went to passage to 1999. Exactly. And I think we saw it to towed away in 2011 or 13. I forget exactly. I met up with the shipmates in Al, in, um, in a Vallejo. And we saw it. It was all rusty, hadn't been kept up. It was being towed away to turn I into razor those blades. Pictures, man. And we had a few beers and right. sent it off. I, I've seen trip, those huh? pictures. Well, so the cool thing for me was like right around that time that you guys were starting to do all that stuff. 
I was keeping up, trying to keep up with where they were sending them out here because it kind of went back and forth a little bit. I right. think it even made its little, a little trip down to Texas for a minute, or at least there was speculation that it was going to go down yeah. there or something was going on with that. But I kind of kept up with it. I never really kept up with the Camden or the, the squadron as much, but I always kept up with where the Mount Hood was going because it was always that I remember the decommissioning ceremony. I remember standing there and feeling that pride of knowing that, you know, we seen this ship out, you know, we, we was on it. It's last right. days. And it felt good to know that, you know, I was a part of that. So I always kind of kept up with it, you know, to some extent. And then I started seeing all these posts on Facebook from you guys. And I was like, Oh, this is awesome. And you guys, some people were like taking pictures, trying to get up there, get, you know, as much of the ship as they could, things like that. So it was really cool to see that there was other people that were feeling the same way about the ship that I felt, you know, like, like I always, I always tell my yeah. kids during my time, I probably didn't like it as much. <laughs> I probably wasn't as happy. I didn't like the long hours. I didn't want to work, you know, like in Washington, when it rains, they would have you, you know, swab up the standing water, right? Well, it's raining, you know? And so I would be out yeah. there being like, this is pointless. It's, an, it's shoveling, <laughs> it's shoveling, shoveling a snow exactly. in a blizzard. Yep, I'd be out I there get you. cussing. I, I was like, seriously, man, this is ridiculous. Like, it's still raining. You know that, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're like, doesn't matter. Get the water up. I'm like, look, more, <laughs> more of this is falling from the sky. I don't know if you can see it. Look around. But it's just going to, I was like, yeah. why don't we just take the brooms tomorrow morning and sweep it over the side and we're done. It's like, nope, it'll rust. I was like, this makes no sense. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, none of it made any yeah, sense. It's tedious work. <laughs> I get it now, but I was young back then and I was still new to the Navy. So tedious work seemed to me like it was pointless work. I, I get it. You can't have a bunch of guys sitting in the space for eight hours because there's, they're going to end up fighting. There's going to end up being some kind of stupid wrestling match. Something's going to happen. Something's going to get broke <laughs> yep. when you leave these guys to their devices. But, you know, it, it's so I get it from that aspect, but it was always the, why are we doing this? This is pointless. You know, shine the bright work. Didn't I just bust this rust five days ago? Why do I have to do it again? You know, that kind of stuff. But uh, I still look back on it with the utmost respect and, and pride and happiness because even through those hard things, we were still able to smile at the end of the day. You know, we still did things like still beach picnics and things like that, you know, fed the hammerheads and, you know, chucked out some, you know, meat to the, to the sharks and stuff like that. But, you know, like uh, during that time, um, <laughs> I had, I had a friend, a couple of buddies of mine that were on the hood with us and, you know, they had guitars and we would, we would jam out and stuff. And we thought we were going to be a little band, you know, it was, it was, it was kind of cool to have that camaraderie, you know, aside from when you knew, you knew when ships work knocked off, you were going to go be able to at least kick it in some space with a bunch of people that you got along with. And, you know, that kind of made the time go by a little bit quicker and a little bit better. So I always look back on those, those times and uh, appreciate the hard days. You know, it, it, it's more of that. Oh, for sure, man. It was, you know, you run at the very end. I was on in the middle. So 71, I've, you know, I just hung out with, and I've done podcasts with guys that were there when it was brand new. And they told me that it was full of reservists wow. when it was launched in 71, went off to Vietnam. And then, uh, you know, there was guys I met after who were, that was their in-between ship, like Derek Grover, who, uh, served on cruisers and he became, uh, you know, Marine corpsman, yeah. combat corpsman and all that. And, um, it was interesting to watch that go and, um, you know, to see where he came from in the eighties. And then I just, I just missed him. Then I came on and then the, the next crew came on. I don't know much of what happened yeah. much after 93. Cause that was my last year. I get, I get in a motorcycle wreck in 92 and I was in oh, med hold okay. for a year in Oak Knoll, which is a naval yeah. hospital in Oakland. I don't know exactly what year that got shut down, but. I was there. It was like shore duty. They, they stuck me in a mail room. It had nothing to do with my lifestyle. I hated it. And, um, I'd take EMT training and teach classes on the base and stuff. And then I get out and I was like, okay, oh, into the world of sales and entrepreneurial adventures and misadventures right. and, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> climbing and falling yeah. off the mountains, you know, 
skydiving without parachutes and sometimes <laughs> hang gliding. But, you know, it all brings it full circle. So you're, you're watching the history of it as I cap this off. You were there at the end after this ship had been in Vietnam in Desert Storm and then probably in some operations in the Middle East. And no, it, it didn't really. No, the, the Mount Hood never made it to no, post 9 11. It never did. It never did. But it, but it made it to the first operation there. And there was sort of some more peaceful years from 91 on. And, uh, then you signed that thing off eight years later. Who knew that ship was going to be out of business? I thought that yeah, thing would keep yeah. rolling for decades. So essentially, 71 to 81, that's 10 years to 91. That's 20 years. The ship lived about uh, 28 years and then they decommissioned it. And it was the last AE, which I didn't really think about until yeah. you brought that up. It was, know, the it was the last, last AE, AE. And we did um, a, a couple of exercises on that mini pack that, um, I believe we still hold the record for um, biggest payload. Uh, now, don't quote me on this. You'd have to look it up and, and verify to make sure. But I know at the time. You, you, you would have to be up against Boson Johnson to see. Well, if you I know really they gave that. us a couple of. <laughs> the fastest transfer rates in the fleet were when from the guys I knew. I well, don't know. Maybe the, it got better, but it wasn't they were the, triple it was transfer stuff. rate. It was um, how many, how many, uh, how much ammo uh, we had on board our payload. Um, we stacked, we stacked out every deck, oh, okay. including the deck up by stream division and all that. We stacked it out. They were doing it for a reason. Um, wow. they wanted us to get that last record before we decommissioned the ship. And I believe we got it. I believe we just skimmed through it, but I believe we got it. And there was a, another one that they did. Um, I'd have to look it up again to see, but there was two that we got while we were there in the last year that um, kind of solidified us, our little place, our little place in history as far as the AEs and the AOEs were concerned. Because I believe when we stacked out, we stacked out higher than any AOE at that time. Now, that may have changed right before the AOEs wow. went decommissioned. They may have one up us because they had a little more room. But I know for a while, I'm, I'm pretty sure we stood with that record. So, you know, it was just that last little accolade to the AEs because they did so much for the fleet. Yeah, it's, I don't know what, I think they use MSC ships yeah, or something. Yeah, well, I mean, at one that. point, at one um, point, they I'm had the sure. AOEs transition over to the Merchant Marines. And then I... I believe they've got a different yeah. class of an AOE. It's called something different now, but I believe it's a different class, and I believe it's all ran by Merchant Marines now. Yeah. Yeah, what a change. We got rid of our own thing. But um, it's been a great podcast with you, my friend, and I hope everybody enjoys this. And uh, if Josh you know, brings up some memories, reach out to him, say hi. And if you're an old shipmate that hasn't talked to me in years, hit him up yeah, on I, I didn't get to mention there's no. a bunch of people I wanted to be able to. So maybe maybe I'll come back and do another. Well, maybe I'll come back and do, ahead. A, do another one with some some good sea stories and kind of bounce some ideas off some guys that uh, that were on there. Because I got a couple really funny ones that I think people would get a kick out of. And they would probably be able to tell their own silly stories because, you know, that that to me. That was that was the, the the fun part of it is being able to look back and say you know oh yeah I did this and this but also the oh I remember this one time listen to what my stupid ass did <laughs> you know those kind of things those were the, those are always the ones because people oh, are like sure. wow dude really you did that like you know uh, 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 getting roofied in TJ definitely you know you're gonna want to hear that one you know there's some definite stories that other people have too that oh, yeah. I'm sure kind of compare or you know maybe even better stories <laughs> but just stupid stuff that I've done I'm I'm trying I'm trying to I'm trying to up up the uh, podcast world for the navy out there I have two other friends of mine that we're going to be starting some podcasts uh, I believe oh, US right Navy on. Salty Dogs and another one that I'm doing with another guy John Franza called oh, uh, cool. The Last Details and, you know, yeah, so there's going to be a couple of varieties and types of Navy shows. So different ships, different guys, yeah. different hosts kind of mix it up, get yeah. some different stories out of people. And I want to I want to increase it. I mean, I'm not selfish where the Mount Hood has to be the Len Dempsey show. It's more about yeah. uh, it's about the Navy. And, yeah, I can guide and I can do good podcasts cool, for people though. and stuff. And I'm and I'm good at this. I'm, I'm trying to train there others to do it as well and to expand the fleet and different kinds of ships or 
different kinds of uh, experiences or well, different I aspects. Well, I got to tell you, man, it's, it's really cool you know? to hear that somebody from the Mount Hood has started this, you know, and, and, and is and is working it and trying to branch it out into different areas. Like I was telling my buddy Ben, um, I would I was hoping to maybe mention to you about maybe doing some brown shoe because their their world is 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 a different world, but it's still you know it's still navy. You know, it's still part of, but it, it is a different aspect and you get, yeah. it was, it was like night and day for me. So, you know, definitely those stories of, of brown shoes that always kind of wondered what it was like to be a, 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 or I mean, the black shoes trying to always wonder what it was like to be a brown shoe and the brown shoes always wondering what it was like to be a black shoe. You know, it, 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 it definitely hearing those stories kind of like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. I didn't know they did that or. You know, because like, I remember being a black shoe and being jealous of the brown shoes, you know, like, oh, these guys don't do anything. And then you go yeah. work for them and you realize, well, no, they do. It's just they have their downtimes and they have a different aspect and, and way of looking at things that it doesn't happen that way as a black shoe. So, yeah, I, congratulations and kudos on starting the whole deal with, the, with you know, us Mount Hooders, man. We're, we're, we're a different breed. <laughs> well, that's the end of the podcast. And I just wanted to ask all you podcast fans, AEC Stories fans, and new listeners, please uh, follow us on the AEC Stories um, fan page that's on Facebook. We also have a Facebook page, a regular one, um, AEC Stories um, group as well. Also, we are on iTunes, we are on Stitcher, and we are on um, Podbean. Podbean is the most... uh, probably the most listened to because that's where who hosts our site. So if you could subscribe to us on there, you'll get our newest updates as they come. You might miss us on Facebook. You might miss a great episode if you don't. And that's at aecstories.podbean.com. And thank you for all the support. If you can write us a nice review, we'd really appreciate it. And have a great day. (laughs) 